that the college board, just the company, right, decided to do something and change something that's really a service for colleges, right? So they can evaluate a large group of students. Right. The large, the admissions counselors, if you talk to them at various universities, don't know what to do with even the 1600 score, let alone the essay yet. So they'll score the essay, but what does that mean? Right. No one's really sure yet. Yeah, I would say to that also, sort of what Mike was saying earlier about how this test is more geared towards college readiness than anything, right. um, That's that optional essay is a huge piece of that, right? It's the college board saying, all right, well, we're going to throw this in, and if someone fills it out, it kind of gives you a more dynamic picture of who the student is, how they write, you know, their unique voice. It's, it's a way of getting the standardized test um, sort of up a level, because I'm sure you're aware there's a lot of backlash, right? Like, are standardized tests reasonable? Is it like a socioeconomic thing? I'm sure you know all the controversy around it. So I think going back to Mike's point about you know college readiness and really catering to college admissions people, I think the essay really helps in that way. And just out of curiosity, is it um, an assigned topic? Is it like write yeah. about these three things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 not, it's, like it's not a personal people. essay. Right. So, I mean, it might be. I mean, no, no, but yes, but so you get to see how the student writes, which is right. sort of a unique, about yeah, right, okay. exactly. Right, but like I, from an admissions perspective, I don't think they know what to do with it yet, and mm -hmm. it's just about rounding out the, the application. Right, it's another chance to express your voice. Right, right. Um, so it, it's, it's. I don't have like great advice, like what, it's like a year from now, we'll probably know what to do on that. Right now, we're literally in the first group of students who even have a new SAT score, and that's only like a very small handful. Of Last, it was last spring, right? Right. So we want a handful of people taken and actually gotten a score at this point. I, I just want to go back a tiny little bit. Yeah. How long has it been? Twenty four hundred. Twenty four hundred was. It's like when we did it, it was sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred. When I did it was ago, right? When I did it was sixteen hundred. It was sixteen hundred up until I want to say like oh seven oh eight, and then they changed it. Maybe a couple years ago, and they only had the twenty four hundred exam for a very short amount right, of time. That's what I thought. It was just, it was a very short amount. And yeah, still, the admissions directors don't know how to go back to the 1600. Okay. Yeah, well, the 2400, they have very clear, like, how the 2400 um, maps the old 1600. Right. So, if you look at the history of the SAT, the SAT was originally an IQ test. Right. And it was just very, like, it was relatively difficult for a long time, where getting a 1500 was, like, a very small fraction of the population would get a 1500. Around the late 90s, they changed that. So, they made the test easier. So if you talk to people pre, who took the test pre-97, 96, 97, they were actually on a harder scale than the folks who took it from 97 until 2008 when they went to 2400. They made that test easier because there's a lot more 1500 scores in that 10 year period mm -hmm. than there had been in the previous 10 year period. Then they changed it to 2400, which is just different. Um, the college admissions had no idea what to do with that for the first year or two, um, and then changed it. And now there's, there's still not a mapping of like, well, what does that score mean relative to the other scores? Because ultimately, what a college is trying to do is just have the highest admission scores, right, that they possibly can, because that gets them higher up in the ranking. That's ultimately what they want. Um, so the idea right now in the SAT of how admissions counselors are taking it is they think it's easier, right? And so a 1550 on this test does not mean the same thing as the equivalent of a 2400 test or the 1550 that we want, but they're not sure about that. And what's the correlation of the ACT? Like, yeah, so previously, there's a very clear correlation of like what you got in the 2400, what you get on the ACT, and then what you got in the 1600 SAT to the ACT. That correlation is not really, not really known yet. There's not enough data, right? We were on three tests of the new SAT, so we don't have enough data yet to, to know what that would correlate to. And why do kids choose to take one rather than the other? So that, that's a very good question. It comes down to a couple of things. Um, one is how you how you think and how you do on the test. That used to be a much bigger thing. Now that the SAT is really reverted to being, I shouldn't say reverted, but moved to being more like the ACT. Right. It's not as clear from like the type of student you are or how you think or how you do. Right. right? So often people would take the ACT who were worse standardized test takers but better students. Right? Because it more matched the work they had done in school. So like that's like a very like like okay, obviously there's okay, more nuance to that, but they would take right. the ACT and students who were um, like better test takers and maybe not as good students should take the SAT, right? That's just at a high level. Now it's not as clear which ones you should do, right? It's more about like the way we recommend people do it is you take if you're not sure, right, and you haven't taken both or you didn't take the PSAT, whatever it happens to 
V, take take another score, take another one of the tests. So if you've taken the PSAT previously, we have a rough idea of how you're going to do on the SAT. Let's take an ACT diagnostic, see how you do, and compare where those scores rank, at least in percentile ranks, right? And say, okay, you're 96th on the ACT and you're 85th on the SAT. Well, clearly, you spend your time on the ACT then, right? And figure it out that way, and then and then study for that exam because they are still slightly different. They're different sections. The ACT is still more time pressure than the SAT. It always has been and still is. Although the SAT has moved more towards that, the ACT is still more time pressure. So students who get a bit flustered should maybe take the SAT. So it just depends a lot of factors. But it's, I always say, like, just go to the data and figure out what makes the most sense for each individual student. So does that mean for students taking the SAT as practice? Because there are a lot of questions about ACT, right? Yeah, there's, I mean. But not a, a lot for the new SAT. Where we get the. Like the new practice. SAT, new practice with SAT. Yeah. So there, there's a fair amount of practice uh, available out there in practice tests. So the College Board released five full practice tests with answers mm -hmm. um, that are available on their website when they came out with the new SAT. Um, since that time, over the last, since that got released in March, so what are we like seven months? There have been there's been a lot of material released on the new SAT. Because so, they're still not stable yet. I mean, yeah, they're not stable, but they can mimic yeah. the questions and create and create practice exams. So there's there's hundreds of practice exams already for the new SAT that are available, um, whether for purchase or um, free online. There's been a big movement on that. There's lots of people who, if you talk to people who run test prep book companies, um, they spent literally like from March to May just writing. Right, like they would like they bloated up all their staffs by like five or ten authors. They're small and, and wrote for for months. I was with a guy on Tuesday night who runs the test prep uh, book company here in New York, and he had hired like ten part time writers from March to May, and they wrote literally thousands of questions to match the new SAT. So according to your experience, are they doing a good job? No. What the they SAT? Are ready, yeah. Um, I don't know because no one. No, none of these kids have gone to college yet, <laughs> so it, it's hard to know. Yeah. I think in a year or two we'll know. And I mean, ultimately, the college board made a decision that was a business decision for them, right? Like we should, like everyone should remember that they were getting killed by the ACT. If you look at the market share that the ACT had versus the SAT, it was just a, a gross story as opposed to not a gross story. So they needed to do something, and they did something. It wasn't ultimately like, I mean. I would say it wasn't necessarily with like, hey, what are the best interests of the students? Although it was trying to accomplish the goal of the universities, which would ultimately be the best interest of the students. It was very much a business decision around we're losing market share, right? And we want to be more like that there. Wasn't some of that because of uh, criticism that the uh, SAT was uh, discriminatory? Uh, Certainly. Uh, have they tried to address that? Yeah, that, 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 that's right. So what they tried to do is make it, it was discriminatory in that, well, there's a bunch of reasons people think they try to make it more about the work you've done in high school and does that match, right? Because the idea is that most of the curriculum across schools is, is fairly similar, right? If you look at like a broad, like US level, maybe not school to school, but um, that was their movement towards that. And the ACT had not had as much of that criticism as the SAT had had. Um, so yeah, that, that was part of the movement. Do the schools, <coughs> do the colleges, if you're giving them ACTs or SATs, does anybody, I mean, yeah. does some schools say, we only accept the SAT? No, so every school in the country takes SAT and ACT now, as of two or three years ago, that okay. was the case. Um, I, I think, so like, if you said, hey, like I have a 99 percentile score, I can get a 99 percentile score on the ACT, or I can get a 99 percentile score on the SAT now, which one should I put my, my focus on, given how I think admission counselors will re re respond? I'd probably say ACT for this cycle, right? So if you're applying for this cycle, I'd say go ACT because admissions counselors know exactly what they're gonna do with that score. It's the same score that they've gotten for the last, you know, seven. Um, so do you have any other questions? Um, so in the data conversion chart, it yep. says they want them to take an ACT. Yep. Um, but because there have been so many students who've taken the new SAT, mm -hmm. do you think that chart is accurate or do you think they're gonna change it in the next few years? I bet it'll change in the that like there will be minor differences but it'll change like a 32 beat system the SAT that's essentially what you're saying um because I've had those conversion charts for a long time I think that'll change because those are all data driven mm -hmm. and the data for the
the S and P is very small right now, um, especially versus the OTC. So I think that's going to change in the next couple of years. Yeah. But Mike, would you say that necessarily the new SAT is something to be feared? I mean, no. or would you say for the right student, it could be a huge opportunity? So as we were discussing, this test is completely different, right? Yeah. For the right student, you know, this could be an opportunity to really outshine numbers you might have gotten on the old SAT. And I also think if you're going to do better on the SAT now than the ACT, you should still take the SAT. Right. Right. If everything is equal, right, if you can get the equal score on, on both, I would take the ACT. But if you're going to do better on the SAT, which is totally possible, then the SAT is where it focuses your time. Uh, it's still there. At 15.90 on the SAT, is still going to be an awesome score, right? And if you're at 15.90 on the SAT and a 32 on the ACT, well, certainly your SAT score is better. And admissions, um, admissions counselors at universities are going to view it as such. Now, uh, this is probably a stupid question, but let's say you take both the SAT and the ACT mm -hmm. and you get a great score on one and not as great a score on the other. Yeah. Do you have to submit both to uh, colleges? So it depends on what you filled out in your application. You know, you can release the score preemptively to the, to the universities. Um, you don't have to, though, right? You can get the score and then, and then send it to the university. So it's up to you and how you approach that. Um, I often tell people, like, especially the first time they're taking it, do not write the score. So there was, yeah, there, there probably are, and there was also a change. So on the 2400 SAT, you used to be able to combine your scores, right? So let's say you took you took an exam, you got an 800, 700, 700, right? On reading, you got 800, you got 700 in the other two sections. And the next time you took it, you got uh, a 700 on the reading, you got an 800 on math. Okay. You could then combine your scores with the best ones and only send those to universities. So some universities are like, wait a minute, like that's not the same thing, because you have people who had perfect 2400s who like literally never gotten a perfect 2400 yeah. on the exam. Right. So there are a handful of universities that wanted to see all of the exams leading up to that mm -hmm. to see how like how you were actually doing. Because um, you can imagine like if someone's really gaming the system, they really prepare for the math section one time, right. they really prepare for the reading section sometime, they really prepare for the writing and like, and that, that happens. Right. Where people are reporting really high scores and then they're like, wait a minute, that's not actually, it doesn't correlate with their performance when they get here. Um, so some schools have done that, and I don't know which ones, but like when we go through the process, we always do that, yeah. So can you not do your score in the SAT? You, you can right now, yes. Okay. You can super score. And you can super score the ACT too. You can, yeah. There, that, that's one where some universities, especially Southern universities, so like Vanderbilt, Emory, Duke, um, don't let you super score. Um, but they've been dealing with ACT forever, so they kind of like, yeah, here's, here's how we're going to do it. Um, but yeah, a lot of the schools in the Northeast will still let you super score the ACT. Um, I think there'll be a movement away from that in the next few years, but we'll, we'll see. I think it only takes, it only takes a couple of universities saying we don't want to do that. I mean, the general idea to take away from the new SAT is that it's a very dynamic test. With the subscores and cross scores, this is all very different. Um, and Mike was sort of alluding to the fact that universities don't necessarily know what to do with those yet, but you can you can see where where the SAT is going with this, right? Like they're trying to produce results that that show a very dynamic student on on lots of levels, not just you know can you plug in this number and see if it fits. Um, so it's really interesting. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I think you'll see. I mean, it's, if you're in a you're in the place now where you're applying, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage than someone five years from now, right? Once they have enough data and we may figure out what to do with these cross scores and these sub scores and figure out how the admissions are going to handle them. Um, so anyway, I, I do think there's a, a disadvantage now, but also in some ways like um, an advantage because like it's the first time taking the exam and the exam will probably evolve as well. The, I think the questions are probably going to get harder again over time, right? They're a little bit easier right now than they will be over time as well. Well, I think it's also that if the colleges don't yet know what to do with it, mm -hmm. it goes down in its importance for application. That's right. Like, in other words, then they're going to look to grades and look to essays and look to interviews. Right. And that would be another thing they look at, but if they're if it's still fuzzy to them, they that's can't. Right. And probably for like that was a movement that was that's been happening in colleges the last ten years, certainly, especially if you look at um, some of the northeast like more like these liberal arts schools. Right. Right, like a, a Colby or, or Bates or Williams.
have started, um, I can't remember what it was, uh, but the, the other couple have, where they don't even require you to put the standardized test in. It's like one less opportunity to show why you should go to school there. So I think people by and large have sent it in, but they don't require it. Well, there are like, I mean, I think there are like 800 schools in the country that don't require it at all. Yeah. And, and many that, there are a few that never have, so. There are a few that never have, there's yeah. a bunch that don't, and then there's a bunch that have recently not said that they don't, but more on the elite level, where it like really, for a long time, has like a few from a 1400 direction right. in here, and they've started going that way as well. So I think you're seeing an overall movement away from like standardized tests being super important, um, but it's, it's still part of the admission process. Um, a little bit about how to prepare uh, for college. So I think we covered a lot of this, so I'll be relatively quick through this. Um, like we talked about, if one of the things that they consider uh, is the SAT or the ACT, there's other things that go into that application. You should always be thinking about what makes you unique, like what makes you you, and why does that college make sense for you? Oftentimes, um, especially for, for smaller schools, they'll want someone who's a great match with that college and knowing about that college and what's unique about that college and why you potentially match is really important. And you can convey that in what your extracurriculars are, what your essay says, and figure out how you match with that school is super important. Um, cool. So just to go through standardized exams real quick. So we talked a little bit about this. There's, there's an ACT path, just like there's an SAT path. There's an exam earlier, often um, offered freshman or sophomore year. Um, can be offered as early as third grade. That's often done in, um, in this, there's a couple programs in the, the southern half of the country. So I grew up in Kentucky, so I know about these, where they make you take these exams. I took the SAT the first time when I was in sixth or seventh grade, and the ACT around that time as well. There's like a talent identification program that do runs that you take the SAT for, and the ACT is maybe Emory or Vanderbilt. I don't remember which one that was for. Um, but you take it very early. I don't generally recommend practicing that early, um, but there's a path to do it. So just like the SAT, there's a way to get ready for it as well. Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but the ACT is you know, four standard sections, um, has been for a long time, English, math, reading, and science, and again, an optional um, writing test essay, same as the SAT one. Not shocking, the SAT matched that pretty much exactly. Um, cool. Um, so then, the, if you look at um, the SAT and the, the ACT now, the way that these sections are broken down, especially across English, math, and reading, are very similar to the SAT. Like you'll notice not a lot of differences between these in terms of the subjects, what they're covering. I will say the math on the ACT, there's more of it, but it's not as difficult. Like the, advanced, the uh, Passport to Advanced Math in the SAT is a little bit harder than any of the math that really appears on the ACT but your timing matters a little bit more. Science tends to be a, a section on the ACT that hangs a lot of students up, because it's really a combination of reading comprehension plus interpretation of graphs, charts, numbers, right? So it combines a couple things that it, there's, not, there's not as many students who are strong in both. Oftentimes you'll find a student who's strong in one or the other. Um, And then just the general structure, again, it's always the same for the ACT, just like the SAT. you notice it's a little bit shorter in terms of total duration, um, and that there's you know, four to five multiple choices per question as opposed to four across the SAT. And again, no penalty for wrong answers, which has always been the case with the ACT. That's not something that's new. Yeah, and then I think we talked a little bit about this, like how do we decide SAT versus ACT? It's really about the individual student, how they think, how they do, and should be, it should be data driven. There's enough practice and enough time that you're taking the SAT or the ACT, diagnostics, practice exams, whatever it should be, that you should be able to figure out which one you think you'll probably realistically do well on. I always tell um, students to focus on one, like make the decision and focus instead of jumping back and forth, because they are, they are slightly different how you prepare for each of these exams. There's obviously a bunch of overlap, but there are some differences as well in terms of strategy, um, things to go back over in terms of review. And so spending time on, on one is, is really important. Although if, for instance, if we have a student right now who has done pretty well, I mean, they've taken two SATs, they've kind of plateaued even on their practice exams. And he was like, hey, why don't I try an ACT, see if I do, do better. 
Um, so he took a diagnostic with us. It actually did a little bit better than we anticipated and what he did. It's like, hey, why don't you spend some time and see if you can get a great score? There are those exceptions to the rule, but by and large, people should, should focus on, on one. And then as it says here, you don't need to take both. Right? You, don't, you don't have to do that. Um, yeah, and then there's SAP subject tests. So a lot of um, your more top universities, you know, your Harvard, your, your Yales, expect you to take subject tests and to do well on them. Right, to have a slew of not only subject tests, SAT subject tests, but also AP tests that you've done well on, right? To show mastery in subjects, right? And the idea partly there is to see how you do when you have to have a deeper dive into a subject, how you do in terms of knowledge base, right? So you should take SAT subject exams, just like AP uh, exams, that you've taken, like, taken a lot of classes in that, and you have some expertise, and then you review that and hopefully do well on that. And those, those exams, especially for universities where the mean SAT score is quite high, um, the, um, the general SAT or the ACT, are start to be the things that separate students out, right? So if a student comes in, you know, if you, just for instance, if you get a 1600 on the SAT and you want to go to a Harvard or a Yale or a Princeton, 25% of the students there have a 1600 score on the SAT. That's a 75th percentile score at a university like that. But then if you start digging into their SAT two subject tests, that's where you start seeing some stratification Right. There will be kids who have five, eight hundredths on subject tests. So if that's your aspiration, that's kind of the expectation for these places, um, which is obviously very different than it once was. Um, talk a little bit about that. Um, okay. Wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, to go back, there's no problem. General education, one math, one humanities, one science. Right. And the maximum required is, is three subject tests on there. Although you often find on applications to the top universities that a lot of students have six, seven, eight. I mean, just what you'd expect um, on that. Yeah. Would you say that even though the recommendation is one math, one humanities, and one science, if there's one area that you really struggle with that you're not great with, you should stay away from it? Yeah, totally. Right. Like, if you're reporting a score of six fifty on something, if you're applying to one of the schools that uh, that requires this, isn't going to do you any good. Right. These all need to be really top level scores. And yeah. how long are these tests? These are uh, it's a couple hours. I, mean, I think they're about two and a half, three hours. They're all slightly different. I, can't, I don't remember offhand, actually, um, for each of these. Um, and then academics, which we talked a little bit about. Um, so grades are the most important college admissions, as, as you probably expect. It's a long track record as opposed to a day. Right, so it's what you've done in your academic performance, how serious you are. Um, it's important for, for students, no matter where they're applying to school, that they're taking classes that are challenging. Right, that you're taking honors or AP, whatever it happens to have, uh, your school happens to have, or um, that you show that there's success in those, and that also shows that you're college ready, right, beyond just the, the, the standardized test. And also showing a, a, um, a breadth of subjects is important as well if you're capable of doing it right. So science, math, um, humanities, and having that breadth is really important. Uh, most univer universities consider how many AP exams, or sorry, how many AP classes you've taken as very important as well, because the idea those are supposed to be college level work, and your performance in there often matters quite a bit. Um, and they also consider how you've done over time, right? So if you did worse as a freshman, and did better as a sophomore, and better as a junior, and then the best as a senior, colleges think that's a, a positive sign. So plan early, because obviously your, your GPA being pretty poor your freshman year can affect you throughout the, the rest of um, your high school career and then into your college admissions. Um, but also it's never too late as well. So they want to see that improvement over time. Something um, makes me want to jump up and down screaming and I don't even have to apply. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, wait a second, they're high school students. Why are they doing a college level work? Like it's, it's so backwards, right? I mean, uh, like do college level work at college. You would, you would think so, yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I, I can't make them change it, so. <laughs> um, cool, so this talks a little bit about what people are con considering um, as well. I talked a little bit about this, of taking classes that are, are more challenging, that are high level, considered a college level, and then having representation across what are really the five core areas, what they're considering. So math, science, English, social studies, and a foreign language. Um, Pretty much every university wants you to take a couple years of foreign language at whatever high school you happen to go to, at, at the minimum. 
Um, and not, not blown off the lectures, because obviously those are affecting your GPA. Right? If you get a D in course, it counts just the same as a D in chemistry. Um, yeah? So what you're saying, like, if it's on, like, you're 